Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning into the Screw the Cubicle channel today. I am joined by someone who is rewriting the rules for building a business in a way that feels good, authentic, and get this completely off social media. So Bradley Morris is the creative mind behind Magic Media and Magic Kids. And with over two decades of experience, he's been creating coaching and building communities that thrive without relying on vanity metrics like the likes or the algorithms. So Bradley's story is pretty inspiring to me because eight years ago, he made the bold move to leave social media completely and really focus on real world relationship based connections. And since then, he's launched a really popular workshop called Thriving in Business Without Social Media, which has helped thousands of entrepreneurs break free from the social media trap and find meaningful ways to grow their businesses. So in his workshop, which we'll share more about it during our conversation, he shares 19 powerful relationship-focused marketing strategies. And these strategies have consistently helped him to grow his business and impact without ever having to post a social media update. So he's here today to show us how we can reclaim our time, our energy, our attention, our creativity, and build a successful business that aligns with what we love more to do. Bradley, I am so excited to have you here. and. I thought it was great to wake up at 5.30 in the morning for you because this is one of the interviews I'm really excited to do this month. Thank you for waking up early on my behalf. <laughs> I appreciate that very much. Okay, so you left social media, I think, is it seven, eight years ago, which must have eight felt like- years. Eight years. The year my ago. son was born. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. What a great milestone and good anniversary date to remember for sure. <laughs> uh, what was like the turning point for you to decide to step away and how did it affect your business in the first few months when you did that? Originally, I loved social media. I was on it for 10 years. I was a daily poster. I was posting one, two, three times a day. I was doing the memes, the videos, the selfies, the pictures. I was I was in it. Um, but it slowly, and I think as the algorithm took over, as they uh, commoditized us, the users, um, it lost the fun factor for me. And there was about three years before leaving that I wanted to leave, but my business, I thought my business depended on it. Um, I, because that was where I was mostly, I had an email list and I had a social media following. And so I'd thought about it. I created a group in Facebook three years before leaving called, uh, evacuate Facebook. And I wanted to get <laughs> off. I just didn't know how I didn't have the answers. And there was, there was a bunch of reasons. I mean, the algorithm felt like it was rigged against us. I was seeing division at that time. Uh, that it was becoming a toxic wasteland. And that was eight years ago. That's not today. Today, it's, I mean, far worse than it was back then. Mm. Even then, I was noticing self-censorship. I was noticing the beginnings of censorship at the time. And so were there, all, there were all these things that were starting to creep into my field of awareness that just felt gross and off and out of alignment with I mean, my hat says free. I became an entrepreneur 20 years ago because I sought freedom. I wanted freedom right. of expression. I want freedom of creation, freedom of finances. And what I saw happening there, that and the social media companies owned everything I posted. And that also felt out of alignment. So I, I work hard for what I create and I want to own it. Mm -hmm. So there was there was a moment though, if you want me to get into the moment. And that was where everything changed for me. I was... It was about three months after my son was born. I We just launched a new branch of Magic Media at the time. It felt like the first time in my career, and I'm, I'm 20 years in now, so then I was 12 years in, where my entrepreneurial and my artist self were fully merged in a, in a project that I was working on called the Great E-Course Adventure. It was like an Indiana Jones meets Saturday Night Live business course. Which is where I found you. I remember telling you this, that you were one of the first people, you probably were the first person and your partner at the time that really yeah. inspired me to like be f engaging and fun and have fun producing content and teach in a way that didn't feel like, I don't know, you were back in academia, you know, or a classroom. So I really owe it to you that really helped me create one of my first courses uh, that made it like animated and, you know, just like a fun way to create it. And yeah, you're such an inspiration. I'm so glad I found you through that too. That is so cool. That's, that's so fun. 
And yeah, that was it. That was, we had this moment standing up on a mountain, another mountaintop experience, but my business partner and I, before creating the great e-course adventure, and we'd had this other thing called the e-course blueprint and it was good. The information was good. It was produced well for a talking head thing. Um, but when we asked ourselves, will we purchase this thing? The answer for both of us was no. And we were like, well, why? Well, it's not entertaining. It's not fun. It's not creative. It doesn't feel inspiring. And it doesn't feel like authentically who we are and what we want to be expressed. So that was what began the journey. But I digress. The, the actual mountaintop moment that I'm talking about around social media is... We were in that chapter of launching the great e-course adventure, which felt like a big turning point in my career. It was a big turning point in my career. Um, and my son was born. We were three years on this new island living in like Canada's Hawaii paradise. And uh, I was watching the sun go down and just feeling really grateful. And then all of a sudden I caught my mind flashing forward to the post I was going to put on Facebook later that night about the moment I was in and therefore I left the moment. And it felt like these octopus tentacles were reaching into my sphere. And it was like Zuckerberg was pulling out my experience from me. And I realized I no longer owned my experience. Mark Zuckerberg owned my experience. I wasn't present anymore. I was in the future thinking about a post and it just felt so wrong to me that I went home, I told my wife that night, I'm like, I'm, I'm leaving social. And I reached out to friends and I canceled all my accounts and deleted everything and left the next day, which was terrifying because I had a baby and a new business. And, you know, there's like, there was a lot of reasons to not get off social media in that exact moment in my life, but I did. Mm, mm. Yeah, I feel that as well. Like one of the, actually, you know, I, I'm a big YouTube girl. I'm a video girl. I love YouTube for the fact that like I can do, you know, have content like this featured on my channel, but not having to like constantly be feeding it daily, you know, with, and feeding the monster to be able to get people to watch my videos, you know? Um, and mm -hmm. I find whenever I, you know, I still have an Instagram channel where I do share here and there bits of sort of my lifestyle choices and, you know, my travels and things like that, Mo mainly as sort of a bit of a um, recording place for me to remember where I've been <laughs> every year when I travel. But what I do notice is every time I do post an experience, like what you're mentioning there, um, or even anything about, you know, a new course or whatever I might be promoting that month, I do feel like this energy, like this depletion of energy that happens because I'm thinking so much about how people want to perceive this experience for me. It's less about like how I want to truthfully, genuinely say the things I need to say and more about like, does this fit in the, you know, does, you know, is this a carousel? Is this a real, is this, you know, it starts to get really technical, you know, sometimes yeah. on Instagram, for example. And then what I find is after I do that thing, I'm uninspired after that. Like it feels like pulling teeth. Something didn't feel yeah. right, you know? And I, and I'm, I'm, you know, wondering and curious about like when you took social media out of your life and you focus more on sort of other aspects of your business that maybe were blind spots of what you could have grown or expanded in like relationships, for example, now yeah. that you have more energy for that, you know, it opens up a whole possibility, a whole world to other options, you know, to grow your business. Um, what changed when that happened? Like what then did you spend that extra energy and time on and did reclaiming your time and your focus from social media influence your creativity overall, fulfillment? Like what, what did it bring to you in exchange when you made that decision? Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, I probably rec reclaimed three to four hours a day wow. of my time. That's a lot of time. Um, and at first, I remember it felt really empty. Um, it wasn't like all my friends started texting and calling me and inviting me to parties and potlucks and, you know, we're going to do this thing. Nobody called me and said, Hey, I noticed you're gone. Where'd you go? What happened? You know, like these are people that were following my work. They were friends from high school, from college, from business. Like nobody gives a shit is what I realized. <laughs> And life goes on, but it did, I felt like I was erased. And so when we create space for ourselves, something has to fill the space. And so I filled the space. I, I choose, 
a word every year that I make my mantra that I try to work on. And for the first two years after leaving, my word was relationships of how do I cultivate real world relationships? How do I, instead of needing 10,000 or 100,000 followers on social media and 10,000 plus people in my email list, how do I live my dream life with 10 relationships? How do I cultivate 10 business relationships that cover all of my needs, that help me to build what I'm trying to build and do my creative work? And so that's that's been my mission. And that's what I figured out. And it completely transformed how I create. It transformed how I do business. My business models for my company changed completely as a result of that question. And the workshop that I teach thriving in business without social media, I have 19 relationships based marketing strategies that I have done and do do on a regular basis for magic media, magic kids play chee ball or other business. And then the, the projects that I work on with clients and, and partners. So, so much changed and yeah, my, I mean, my creativity flourished as a result of not having my brain hacked to the matrix anymore. <laughs> It's like all of a sudden there was space for my thoughts instead of the thoughts that were being fed to me on the feed, which if you think about the feed, you're not in charge of what you're being fed. You're literally being streamed, whatever the algorithm wants to give you, which might be completely out of alignment with everybody's life. And that's what I found. So I got to come back to myself. Um, I focused a lot you know, even though my business is online and has been online for 20 years, I focus so much on building real world relationships where I am on my island. So I started a men's group, which um, I actually were, I just stepped down as the, the leader of this group after six and a half years of meeting weekly. We met weekly all through COVID. We met weekly through everything, thick and thin. Uh, and it was amazing because we had a, our our group was called Man Ventures, and we did whatever guys showed up Tuesday, decided what the adventure was the well, following that. week, and you can't do the same thing two weeks in a row. And we did some of the most wild and incredible experiences I've ever had in my entire life. In fact, Magic Kids, our, our story company, started as a result of 12 men getting together in my studio, writing children's stories one night. And we all wow. read our stories to each other. And that was my first Magic Kids story. So... So much changed as a result of leaving social media, opened me up to what life is actually about, mm. which is not getting followers. Right, exactly. And and I want to go into this because I love that, you know, in your workshop, you talk so much about, you know, shifting from these transactional style approaches to getting clients and community and partnerships and, you know, things like that to a more relational one, right? Which is yeah. something, obviously a big topic post COVID, like how much we understood <laughs> from being away from the people we loved and connections and, you know, what used to be a village, right, to provide us the needs we needed as individuals. And now we live in these sort of nuclear families and communities that are so hard to kind of feel connected to support help in all sort of different versions of life, right, whether you're starting a family to just you had a bad day, you need to talk to somebody, you know, and it's not mm -hmm. always your spouse, <laughs> poor spouses mm -hmm. that have to get the emotional dumping sometimes from one person in the household. And I certainly, you know, have really adopted like this, There, it takes a village, you know, to help us do things like part of, you know, me living a really unconventional life away from my, you know, traditional family and friends I grew up with from high school is finding these like-minded people that mm -hmm. live in, in these communal ways. I mean, the Balinese are the best example of like, you know, they live in compounds where sometimes it's 20, 30 people per compound and no one kind of gets left behind. Uh, there's pros and cons to it all, you know, of sort of like um, being an all up in each other's business, right? And having individuality, right? That yeah. necessary need to. And then always knowing like no one starves, you know, there's no homeless people here. And, you know, there is a, a, a sort of mentality of taking care of each other, foraging together, mm -hmm. you know, all those things that are really beautiful. Um, but going back into sort of the business aspect, like, you you know, online businesses are what helps us to be, you know, location independent, more free to do it from wherever we want to do it and when we want to do it and have access to global clients. And I think online businesses, you know, always tend to kind of like, okay, if you want an online business, you have to have an online presence, right, yeah. to have that happen. So 
I am would love for you to kind of share, I know you have like a full workshop that people should absolutely watch because there's some awesome strategies there, but I'm, I'm guessing someone who's watching this right now is sort of going, okay, I'm interested to do what you did, but like, now what? Like, how do I either move people from my current followers to something else? And where should I be focusing my time? So like, could you walk us through maybe one or two of these strategies and kind of explain why it might be so effective to make that shift or what has been sort of the top things out of the 19, right, of the things that you teach that across the board has produced some awesome outcomes for people that are thinking of moving social media to a different way of marketing? Yeah. Um, so as I said, I got 19, but I'm going to give you the top two uh, that work every time. Uh, so one is your email list is your gold. That is your gold, your gold, your gold. Um, I've had people come to a workshop that I remember one person said she had 90,000 people on her email list. She was struggling to make money and she hadn't emailed them in six months. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and so your email list, treat them like gold. Imagine that your email list is like your friend and you only talk to your friend once every couple months or once a month or when you want something, for example, when you want to sell something. How good of a friendship is that actually? I know for myself, my friendships, I'm in touch with them almost daily, maybe every couple days, maybe every few days, but we're sending messages, we're sending jokes, we're trying to like check in with each other on like, are we staying the course on what we said we're gonna do with our lives? And that is how I treat my friends, that's how my friends treat me, and that's how I treat my email list. So I went from sending emails to my list once every two weeks to weekly, and then my email list is now like two to three times a week, I'm sending inspirational content for them around building their businesses. It's it. I'll grab snippets from my coaching sessions that I feel would be beneficial to share these processes with my audience. And those that want to work with me, that's how I got things they can buy. They can join my membership. They can hire me for coaching. They can hire my team and I to work with them on their project. But the the email list is has been gold it is gold now the question is people are probably like well how do i grow my email list so i stumbled into this strategy two years ago i wished i would have stumbled into this strategy 20 years ago i had tastes of it over the years but i always abandoned it because i just thought it was too simple there must be a different way and this is honestly it's too simple and it's around crafting and touring a signature workshop. So the reason I say I accidentally stumbled into this is I was asked by Tad Hargrave from Marketing for Hippies, who's an amazing marketing coach. And he asked me to come do a workshop for his audience around my strategies on how I'm doing business without social media. So that was the first version of this workshop. We had 1,100 people sign up for that hour-long workshop. I never had 1,100 people sign up for anything I've ever done up until that moment. I had 1,100 new emails in my system, and that almost doubled my emails in my system in a week. And I was like, holy shit, I should probably just keep doing this. And so over the last two years, I've done 36 or 37 different iterations of this same workshop on 37 virtual stages. And so I will reach out to hosts and I will say, hey, here's what we have in common. I have this workshop. I feel like it fills this gap for your audience and what you're doing. Would you be interested in hosting me for this workshop? And I've had so many say yes. And when I, I deliver my 60 minute workshop and the signature workshop is meant to be an audience's first introduction of you. So you share a brief piece of your story that's relevant to the topic of the workshop. You ground people into your philosophy through the story of like, this is what I believe and know to be true. You give them their first breakthrough experience with you so that they can actually trust you and they get a taste of what it's like to work with you. And then the last five minutes or somewhere within there, a commercial break is, is 
a five minute invitation or a call to adventure, as I call it, because I look at us not as marketers trying to flush people down funnels, but we're guides that are trying to lead people up a mountain. And the top of the mountain is the ultimate transformation for your brand and what it is that you do. It's your promise to people if they come on a journey with you or join your programs or hire you for coaching or hire your company or your your agency. It's where you lead them. And your signature workshop is like the base camp experience. It's their first step up your mountain so that they can decide if they want to go all the way to the top with you or if they want to go to a next lookout point. And so the signature workshop, I've grown, I've done about 36 hours of teaching time, less than 35 hours of administrative time because we created, once I knew I was going to do this, we designed systems and templates and all the things so that it was very manageable and scalable. We have hardly any back and forth when we get, when somebody says they want to host our workshop because we have a media page that has all the information. And so let's, let's, let's say 70 hours of actual work and my email list has grown by well over 5,000 people. My, oh. I've generated hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue from teaching one workshop 36 times. So I would say to people who are in the teaching, coaching, facilitation business is you have to have a signature workshop. Don't do podcast tours. Podcasts are fun. This is fun. But I can guarantee that, you know, people will listen to a podcast passively. They're driving. They're doing dishes. I have a podcast too. I post three times a week in my podcast. Like podcasts are fun. It's a great way as a teacher and a leader to show your influence and for your audience to, to get familiar with who you are and what you're doing. But when you go on other people's podcasts, very rarely does somebody at the end of the podcast say, where can people find you? Very rarely do they go to your website, join your email list and buy something. Whereas a signature workshop, they're here, they're live, they're present with you. They're being guided through a transformational experience. There's a call to adventure at the end. They make a decision and a lot of times they will sign up for something the next step up the mountain. So mm. like I, I was on a podcast last year, we had 125,000 downloads in the first week, which is quite a lot. And I thought my email list would blow up, but my email list grew that week by 20 people. I did the signature workshop with that same audience. Two weeks later, my email list grew by five or 600 people. So it's just, it's a, just a different experience having people fully present with you and going through a journey together. Yeah. And I think it almost also filters like the real active seeking clients that are like, I'm willing to stay into a 60 minute, 90 minute workshop because I am yeah. hungry for that solution. And it's a, such a wonderful opportunity to showcase your framework, your philosophy, your story in, in such a depth, right? That it's so hard for a, you know, two minute, eight minute video on YouTube to do. Like you, those are like, I always feel like YouTube for me, cause I've gotten tons of clients from YouTube as well, but they're almost like, I call them like the sprinkles, you know, the sprinkles on the cupcake of like reminders. Mm -hmm. Hey, by the way, I do this. I solved this problem in case you forgot about me six months ago. But really when people do hire me for, especially if you're in premium programs, like, you know, my, my yeah. offers are less tiny size offers. They're premium, intimate products that are thousands yeah. of dollars, right. To work with me. So the trust and credibility <clears throat> will never really be built fully from a short form content. People want to understand how I lead people up that mountain, right? Like you can get yeah. up that mountain many ways, but is it ethical yes. to the morals and values that I stand by, right? Or do we align? Like, it's kind of like being on a date. Like you don't just date anyone right. who's single, <laughs> just like you don't work with just anyone who needs to work with a coach, right? Or whoever yeah. you are, you need to be able to filter and find ways so people can almost like pre-qualify themselves, whether they are aligned with you or not, right? Before they start mm -hmm. inquiring, wasting your time as well, right? If they don't get your message or get your philosophy, um, they're going to ask a ton of questions that take a lot of time to answer, right? But a, a, a signature workshop kind of gets it all done in one go, you know, mm -hmm. so that when it is time to inquire, they've already self-selected that they are the right client for you. It almost acts like a bit of a sales page, you know, to exactly. your offers, which I really exactly. love. Exactly. Right. Um, and I also love that you talk about just one, like one workshop, because I think there's a misconception that you need to have a different workshop for different people all the time. So that feels like a heavy burden, right, to just be all of a sudden a speaker when people don't feel like they're that's their line of work. Um, so how have you sort of decided, like, 
which signature workshop is the one to go on tour with? Um, you know, did you do a vote from, you know, a poll from the partners you had? Have you ta do you tailor different versions of it? How do you scale this to make sure that you are able to do those 37 <laughs> tours with ease? Yeah, so again, it's meant to introduce people to your backstory and your philosophy, and that's going to help create some resonance and trust with them. For me, I stumbled into it, but I've developed a process to help people figure out their their signature workshop topic. And it goes deep into their niching and what they're actively doing, what they're selling, because you want to look at all the different facets of your business and figure out, well, what is the ultimate base camp experience to bring people into, whether they're coming from a podcast or YouTube or social media or somebody else's email list or an affiliate, like this is the gateway to the world of work that you have available for them. So I've been doing this signature workshop for two years. I'm only just now developing my next signature workshop, which to me feels more aligned with what I do at Magic Media, which is transforming your life's work into a work of art. Like, how do you get people to pay attention? How do you make art on the internet that feels in resonance with what your soul's wanting to express? And you do it in a professional way because if it's professional, people pay you like a professional. And that's what we all want here. And so finding the topic is, it's a bit of a, it's a process. Unless it's really clear for you. A lot of people, um, if you're doing coaching work and you keep guiding the same process again and again and again because you know that's the best first step when people come join your coaching stuff to go the rest of the way, then that's probably what your signature workshop should be. If you do breath work or something like that, then give people a taste test of what that experience would be like before they join something deeper and, and more longer term. It really depends. Like I've got, um, we just launched a program around crafting a tour signature workshop, a three month program. We have, I think there's 110 or 120 creators going through it right now. And the topics are so diverse and so different. We have creators and coaches and teachers from every different niche that you can imagine. And so it's really fun to see the directions people are wanting to go but understanding your ultimate who like the the who you want to be working with the audience that you love being in communication with that you have a deep love and respect for that's ultimately what we're trying to get to is we don't want to market and serve everybody we want to market and serve people that align with our values and and align with our own life path so that we don't outgrow what we're doing right now too quickly and get sick of it because mm. we're what we're looking for is like make our life and make our business more streamlined and scalable so we can be more creative and have more fun with our life at least that's my mission is like i want to have as much fun as possible and be as creative as i can and the more i can streamline systems the more that time becomes available to me mm, i love and that And the less you're on social media the more that time will be available to you <laughs> Exactly. I yeah. love that, that one of the metrics you use is fun, which is also mine. If I'm not, if I'm, if fun is not a thing that I reach and hit as a metric yeah. in anything I do, something's wrong, right? And I have to yeah. recalibrate of like, how do I make this more fun? Um, and actually, one of the things that I have discovered is what makes it more fun for me to do. And I do some talk, I don't do it as, um, you know, I actually, this inspired me to do more of it because I tend to kind of, if someone invited me, it was sort of um, an accidental, you know, partnership. I'm like, great, I'll come and do this talk that I usually do, but it's not an intentional, almost like a campaign or a strategy that I do. And so this conversation has inspired me to rebirth my talk to come, you know, and I have all these great partners, what my coach calls like peanut butter and jelly, you know, partners to your business, right? Share the same audience, um, believe in the yeah. same things, but just solve a different stage of the problem yes. but actually it's the same client for both of you um one of the things that i realized that motivates me to do that talk more often is when i don't have powerpoints or slides because i friggin hate them i feel like it distracts me from my flow 
I am so a straight to camera, like I can, you know, that is like a stream of consciousness that comes to me as I'm having mm -hmm. the conversation. It feels more authentic to me versus like, I'm kind of almost policing myself on like what I need to say next and what's the next slide and making sure I keep to this and da da da. And I find that that helps me to go, oh, it's not complicated. It's, you know, and I think that's a, a, a great way to start is A, not to make it complicated, be imperfect because yeah. you if you do yeah. 37 talks like you did there's 37 times to refine it and improve That's it right. and make it better and tad who is also a mutual right person we know i love tad's way of saying about this too because if you watch his workshop that he's done for 20 years from year one you know it's like so different from what he does today the, the crux of it yeah. is the same but the stories are different the way he flows with it is different because it's like just practice right and yeah. each time we gets need to better, put in the reps right? Got to put in the reps at the gym, right? The little dumbbell yeah. curls. Um, and and actually moving imperfectly is probably the best way to go so that you're not stuck in like one way to deliver it. And it's a robotic yeah. sort of structure, but allowing yourself to dance with that topic a little mm -hmm. bit, you know? And I find when I do a, a talk, whether it's live or virtual stages, it helps me actually to like almost look at my work every year, you know, and go, hey, how have I grow outgrown? <laughs> maybe even yeah. things that I used to say five years ago. And what's the new approach of my philosophy or parts of my framework that actually this is my chance to tweak that. This is my chance to say it differently. And that actually helps me to be better and more masterful at the very thing I do because that, it's like almost like using the talk to test out ideas, test out whether that lands properly. Do, do you kind of do that with your talk as well? I love experiments. I've experimented with... love doing experiments because we just don't know till we do it and so i no longer have a fear filter that if i have an idea i'm afraid of it failing i'm like i have the idea i feel inspired about the idea i'm going to try the idea i'm going to see how people respond to the idea and then i'm going to refine the idea and that's how my workshop started and my goal after each delivery is i take 10 or 15 minutes is like what could be better next time where did i stumble how how could I improve the delivery? How could I help people get more results out of this experience? And then I'll just, I'll make some changes. I'll spend 30 minutes and I'll adapt or change or add something or take something away. And it does, it just keeps getting better. But what social media has taught us as creators is that our work is not valuable and we have to make so much stuff and keep reinventing the wheel every single day in order to keep up with everybody. What this is about is like a refinement of what we're already great at. How do we be greater of what we're good at right now by simply tweaking and refining and improving and doing it again and again and again? And to some people that might be boring, but for me, I'm like, that is, that is a path to self-mastery is like, we just keep getting better at the thing that we're already good at. Mm. rather than having to keep reinventing ourselves and reinventing what we're doing and trying to come up with clever things to say to keep up with everybody's perspectives it's just like no just be you you do you and people will find you and then just keep being you yeah, Rinse and repeat. yeah, yeah. totally totally it's, it's a nice thing to sometimes have that boundary isn't it where you have almost it's okay to have some tunnel vision sometimes and actually be focused on your lane and your where you're going and not be compare. you know, social media is unfortunately, unconsciously more on it, we tend to compare, right? We tend to go, oh, yeah. that person's doing it in a way snazzier way than I do, or that person's doing it in this way. And, and then you get distracted from the flow of like, what could have been your way <laughs> if you didn't yeah. even see any of those examples, right? You would have figured it out, you know, on your own, uh, which I, you know, and, part of why I moved across the world was to be away from the media and like that noise that always seem, seemed to have distracted me because I was a people pleaser, you know, and recovering people pleaser. I sort of always wanted to do things in a way that made other people comfortable, <laughs> you know? And when yeah. I wasn't around my family, my culture, you know, all those societal expectations, this really magical thing emerged, which is my own voice, my own truth, my own version of how I wanted to live life that wasn't templated to what people believed were, you know, the way you should do it right in that society. Um, so I totally align with that vision for sure. Um, all right. You've shared so many amazing things. You've inspired me. I want to revive my talk now and make it even better. Um, now for people, 
that have been watching this, they're interested to learn more of those 19 strategies that you cover in the workshop, where's the best place for them to find you, to learn with you, and take the next step after they've watched this? Yeah, so magicmedia.com, M-A-J-I-K, media.com. Uh, that is my website. And you can go to the coaching section. There's a little drop down and you can see live trainings and that'll take you to my next thriving in business without social media workshop. You could also find me at magic media on YouTube and I have hundreds and hundreds of videos. You can find my most recent versions of that workshop if you don't want to wait. And you can also find me, uh, on Spotify and iTunes at the making magic podcast. And magic is always M-A-J-I-K. And all you parents out there, get your butts over to the Magic Kids app at uh, M-A-J-I-K-Kids.com slash app. We're doing the best audio stories on the internet with a big team of voice actors, producers, and writers that are writing the stories for the times we're in for the kids who need to be empowered creators and not screen zombies. And we also have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of inspiring songs from musicians all over the world who are devoted to the kids. Hip hop, rock and roll, pop, reggae, we got it all. And kids meditations, then we design curriculum that go with every single story that we release. So there's hours and hours worth of projects and adventures you can have with your kids which is my greatest joy in life is hanging with my little dude and getting up to all sorts of cool stuff. And so we're trying to create that experience for other parents too, that don't know what the heck to do with their kids. Yeah. I love that. I love that to start it when your kid was born, you know, eight years ago of like that intentional yeah. way of leaving social media. And then now eight years later, you've got a company together. You guys are so cute and adorable <laughs> doing it's this awesome. project and videos together. And it gives you time to spend with your kid and just be creative. What a beautiful gift to give him like i it's i love that we get yeah. to write stories together we go for walking and coffee dates where we map out new stories that we're writing and I love it. then we work on them together like it's it's so, so cool. cool and these are like long-term projects we just finished two stories that we've been working on for two years wow we just finished a graphic novel that we've worked on for two years that's now a 90 minute audio movie that we're producing and my my son's narrating this 90 minute audio movie is he because he's the main character in it like it's just so cool what we can do when we step away from the noise and we get aligned and in tune with what really matters to us and we design our entire lifestyle to go in that direction beautiful magic words thank you so much bradley for coming here sharing your story jamming with me um we'll be sure to put the links to all the things you mentioned today and make sure people find you and yeah let us know in the comments if what your what your aha moment anything that sort of a light bulb moment that came up for you where you're like i'm going to take the step i'm going to take that strategy that bradley shared today and here's what i'm doing and i think there's something really special about dec that declaration you know online to say this is what i want to intentionally do to feel good about my life and my business um thanks again for joining me for staying up in your island helping me wake up in my island from across the world. Uh, let's do it again soon. Thanks, Bradley. Sounds wonderful. Thank you so much. And if you do respond on YouTube, I will respond to your responses, everybody. Yay. I'll find you. <laughs> See ya.